Uh, we're going to do a Bible study today. I uh, hope you're okay with that. And uh, I'm going to invite you, grab your Bibles, and uh, whether it's electronic device, hard copy, whatever you got, looking at your neighbor's Bible, that works too. Um, but we're going to move into a passage of Scripture here um, as we finish out Acts chapter 19, verse 23 down through 41, the final verses there that as we look at this passage of Scripture right here, it is one of those things like, Lord, what is in this for me? You got something in this for me? I mean, I'm just seeing a, uh, I, I'm seeing the picture of of, uh, of the rumblings within a city, and and mostly the challenges within that city under riotous conditions. Is that's what we're looking at? And so, uh, if you'd like to title your message, I titled today's message "Pushback in Ministry." Uh, Pushback in Ministry uh, by a show of hands. You've ever had pushback within your own house? No, look at that. Somebody has popped up fast. (laughs) Yes, I'm with you. Uh, You know, sometimes there is that pushback. And, um, you know, we uh, uh, we can take a few principles away here as it comes to uh, pushback within ministry. Uh, We'll look at those as we dive in. Uh, But I want to I want to bring us back a little bit to last week before we just catapult into today. Uh, And that is, if you remember last week, that the whole thrust that we walked through last week was all about learning the sufficiency of the gospel message that God is greater than our human need. Amen? Amen. That's what the, that's, that was the main emphasis of last week. Uh, and, 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 and we learned along the way, again, as we're just studying through, the, through Acts 19 here, we learned along the way that God is the one that sets people free. That the miraculous thing that he does to bring healing into our lives, that transformation, that new life, that he is the initiator, he is the completer of those things, again, all in the sufficiency of Christ. Uh, and and, and as, as people, we need to be reminded of that. Listen, I'm hoping that I'm ministering to a room with mostly Christians, or, or I'd love to say all Christians, but that's probably not the reality. There's a mixture of people within this room. And, 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 and I would share with you that if you're not a Christian, please realize that we get excited about Jesus because of what he has done for us, not what we can do for him. It's all about the sufficiency of Christ and not how perfect my life is, or even for that matter, how tweaked my life is, okay? It's not about that. It's about what God has done for us. And, and, and man, when we keep that as the central focus of our heart, it seems like that our personality, our thoughts, our, our emotions change, right? When I'm, when I'm dwelling on what God has done for me, I, you know, I, I, I'm way different than when I'm dwelling upon all those things that I have cataloged along the way. It's like, oh, not quite getting that one, right? And so we learn. Now, last week we learned this, that there is some responsibility, okay? Uh, they'll, they'll flesh this on the screen here for us. But in Hosea 4 and 6, last week we saw this, that, that the scriptures reveal through this minor prophet, Hosea, that he was writing for God and God was communicating. He was saying, listen, he says, my people are being destroyed because they don't know me. So he, God brought it back to a personal thing, Old Testament, New Testament, or right now in your chair. It always comes back to a personal relationship with Jesus. And as a result of not knowing God, if, if whether that was uh, Israel's position of just being ignorant of what they should have known, or whether that's your position today as a Christian of being ignorant of what you should know, that it affects the way that we make decisions. And, the, and, and, and really the byproduct of where I am with the Lord, it, it often is revealed in the decisions that I make. Take a look at the screen here. Again, this is stuff from last week that, that in Proverbs 9, uh, 19 and 3, that Solomon writes, he says, people ruin their lives by their own foolishness and then are angry at the Lord. <laughs> doesn't, doesn't, doesn't that really speak to the heart of some issues? It's like, well, God, why did you allow this to happen to me? Right? And we start blaming God. And it's like, well, Jeff, you made that decision. Why are you putting that on me? You know? And, and this is the same thing that we do here in this, in this room. Oh, and this room's going to be a little tough. Even that verse came a little... I can see you guys, you guys constricted like a python here. Loosen up a little, folks. God's grace is greater than your grievous sin and mine. And so I love that. But take responsibility for your own foolishness and don't get ticked off at God because, well, God, you made this happen. No, 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 no. You did it, okay? Can, can you just look to your neighbor and say, hey, be honest. <laughs> that determines how far we go today, if you're being honest or not, you know? And so, um, uh, uh, again, uh, in reality, uh, you know, God, he gives us 
Uh, he gives us free will. Everybody has free will. Whether you're saved or you're not saved. God has granted to humanity free will. We get to choose to yield to him or we get to choose to plow ahead on what we think to be the right thing and the wise thing. It's, it's our choice. And, and men, we, uh, uh, we don't have to beat people into submission to come to Jesus. We just need to realize that God desires to draw all men unto himself. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. That's the gospel message right there. Uh, but, but, but in the middle of the gospel message, we need to realize that there is a spirit of error that is out there. And we went through some of this last week. Uh, we learn um, that when the world tries to handle the matters of the soul by putting in place self-reformation, I'm going to tidy up, I'm going to clean up, I'm going to do uh, what I like to call uh, flesh management. I'm going to look all presentable. You know, I'm going to church and, you know, I'm going to put on my best cologne and whatever shirt I have to make myself look presentable. Listen, if you, if you try to tidy up on the outside without God doing that work on the inside, it just becomes a facade. It's hypocritical in nature. You know, God, God invites us to come as we are, but not to stay unchanged. And I think that's a big problem within the church because people come as they are. Oh, we got that side down, but then we stay as we are. We're not supposed to stay as we are. When I'm, when I'm looking and I'm learning to God, do you realize God, like the one that created heavens and earth, the, 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 the one that created us, that, that has put in motion all of the stuff that we see around us, that God, the God that can do anything, that God, that's our God. And when I'm looking to that God, you know, what, what stifles me in the moment? It's my own unbelief. It's my own uh, sin. It's my own rebellion, bless you. All of those things. And so uh, last week, we, we learned that soul matters, that they cannot be handled with self-reformation. They only get things worse. And then we backed that up with, with exactly what Jesus taught in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, we showed uh, that and we pulled it apart. And so as we transition now into today, uh, as we start looking at what's before us today, um, you know, this, these, these verses, 23 down to uh, 41, the remaining second half of this chapter that Dr. Luke, or Luke, the, the writer, the recorder of the book of Acts, that he devotes so much time to elaborate on this one scene, as opposed to elaborating on what happened in the opening side of the chapter. Oh man, people were, uh, you know, Paul met with 12 guys, and, and then he, he told them about the, you know, the, the, the baptism, and then the empowering of the Holy Spirit, right? He just gives like, just a tiny bit like that. But when it comes to this riotous temple of Diana uh, uh, scene right here. He spends all these verses on this. And I'm looking through this stuff earlier this week. I'm going, uh, well, God, what do I tell your people about this? Do I encourage them in the temple of Diana? The answer is no. Okay, good. <laughs> Sorry to leading you along the way on that one there. Okay. And so we, we ask our question, Why? Why? Why did this happen? Follow along with me. Uh, Acts 19, picking up in verse 23, Luke writes this. He says, about that time that serious trouble developed in Ephesus concerning the way. Who is the way? Who are these folks? Christians. That's right. Whoever said this over here, it's the Christians. That's how they were referred to. Uh, that's how, uh, again, those that have gone before us were referred to. Now, it began with Demetrius, a silversmith, who had a large business manufacturing silver shrines of Greek goddess Artemis. He, he kept many craftsmen busy. He, he called them together along with others employed in similar trades, and he addressed them as follows. He said, gentlemen, you know that our wealth comes from this business, uh, but as you've seen and heard this man, Paul, has persuaded many people that handmade gods aren't really gods at all. And... He's done this not only here in Ephesus, but also throughout the entire province. Of course, I'm not just talking about the loss of public respect for our business. I'm also concerned that the temple of the great goddess of Artemis will lose its influence and that Artemis, the magnificent goddess worshipped throughout the province of Asia and all around the world will be robbed of her great prestige. Father, we are here to look for Jesus. We are here to set our eyes upon your faithfulness. And I pray that you would grant us a moving and a stirring of your Holy Spirit to be strengthened in truth, that when we go out of this place, that all will know that we have been with you. And so we ask this by faith, Father, in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people said, Amen. push back in ministry. 
Well, as we, as we start out, again, we're, we're taking a look at this, uh, this situation that is developing. And uh, I, I want to start us off with this. The first idea is this, is advancing the gospel. We have to understand that why this scene erupted as it did. In chapter number 19, we saw that, that Paul circles back around to Ephesus. And the reason he came back there is because he, he was being led by the Spirit of God. Yes, yes. Uh, but, but, but he came back there because Apollos had been there before Paul. And Apollos was bringing, he was speaking truth. Yep, Aquila and Priscilla said that. He, was, he had it right. But he stopped at the baptism of John. You know, that was a baptism of repentance. He never went on to that place of, of recognizing the life, the death, and the resurrection of Christ and the empowering of God's Holy Spirit. And so, so God sends, um, uh, sends Paul back here at, 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 a, at a short time later, maybe a year or so later, he comes here and he starts ministering in this city. And as he's ministering, not John the Baptist's baptism, but as he's ministering of the fullness of the grace of God and what God has done, people were getting changed. They were taking their sorcery books, their magic books, right? They burned a big old heap of them, we learned last week. Uh, and, and now the tourist trade and the, the uh, little trinkets, the icons that they use to worship here, now this industry is suffering a financial hardship because people are getting rid of their little statues because they're realizing they're being taught that, wait a minute, there's no power in this statue. There's nothing at all that is here. And so, so the, 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 the beautiful side of this is, is all about advancing the gospel. And as we come into this, we need to, we need to make sure that we capture the big picture here, okay? So let me, let me, let me start by taking us to 1 Timothy. Take a peek at the screen here with me. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, Paul writes to Timothy, and he's giving this to Timothy. Um, uh, do we remember what uh, city Timothy becomes the pastor over? Does, does anybody remember that? It's Ephesus. Not at this time, but it's a little bit later, right? So 1 Timothy is written a little bit later. And here's what he gives to young Timothy, again, who's the pastor over that city. He says that this is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. Look to your neighbor and say, that means you. I know we get uncomfortable talking to each other like that, but at least it keeps me, it allows me to keep you on your toes. <laughs> your neighbor sees if you're sleeping, not only me, but your neighbor shares. He says, everyone should accept it. Should he accept what? That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And Paul says, he says, I am the worst of them all. But God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst, worst sinner. God is patient with you and I as sinners. He's patient with us. It doesn't mean that he doesn't have an expectation. It doesn't mean that he won't require a responsibility for us, but he's patient. And you should know that here this morning. You should understand that this morning that Christ came to save sinners. And when, 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 when we advance the gospel, we are speaking of those things in which God has given unto us, in which God has done in us, in which God is doing through us. And the, the, the gospel message as it goes forward, we should realize that in the greatness of God that he deals with us, even on our worst days, even in the times where, where it feels like my sin is just so overwhelming right now, and what happens with our sin? What happens when we have one of those days, one of those weeks, one of those, those months or whatever, where it's like, dude, everything is just going wrong here. We lose motivation. We lose focus. And we need the encouragement. And there's something said about coming to church consistently and regularly. This is not a message for coming to church. You're Christians. You should be at church. It's just, you know, put your car in your garage. Christian, come to church. Okay. We got that. He goes on and he says, that then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. I hope you didn't miss that. Your life is a testimony. When the pushback in ministry happens within your Christian walk, you're not to waffle and run, you're to stand and fight. You're to move forward when you feel like it and when you don't. And remember that much of walking by faith is, is, is a determination of the will and not a, a satisfying of a changing of our emotions. Our emotions change. They change hourly. Listen, if, 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 you, know, um, if, if you didn't eat lunch or dinner today, your belly's going to disagree with you and you're probably going to be a little bit irritable this evening here. 
but, you know, scarf down a hamburger or a nice little steak or pizza or whatever you like to eat, you know, and then, oh, I feel so happy right now, you know, your emotions will change. And when I walk out my Christian faith based on my emotions, well, I'm not living by faith. My faith is a determination of my will to choose God above self and above circumstance. I live by faith. I walk by faith. It's a determination of my will based on the Holy Spirit living within me and the promise of God's word. And so advancing the gospel. Now we learn from the next chapter, Acts 20 and 31, we learn how long Paul was in this town. Paul was in Ephesus for a grand total of three years. Uh, and, and he left right here at the end of, of this riot. But again, the next chapter tells us how long he was there. And we know that when he first came into this town, that the first two years of him, of him being within this city, that he spent that time. He first, he went to the Jews in the synagogue and he was there for like three months and they got all ticked off at him and, and chased him out. And, and he took it and he rented a place literally right next door to where they were out of the synagogue. Uh, it was a school. It was a lecture hall. Okay. Uh, we saw that Acts 19 verses nine and 10. Um, and, 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 and as he's there lecturing here, uh, sharing, teaching the people that anybody could come, anybody within the city. And so all the folks from the, the, the city and the surrounding areas, they would come in and they would hear. And, and what was God doing? Well, as God's word was going forth, as people were being taught what, what it is that God had done for them and the response of how they respond to God, it grew throughout that city. And hopefully the same thing happens with you. Listen, if your Christianity just stops here on Sunday morning experience, you're missing out the best part of God because he's with you Monday through Saturday as well. You can talk to him. You can look to him. You can ask him for help. You can receive a word from him. All of these things. And, 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 and again, we're not, just, we're not just cleaning ourselves up to come to church. Oh, pastor told me to get to church. Here I am. And oh, uh, pastor, I brought my Bible. Here it is. Hey, awesome. I'm glad you're here. And I'm glad you have your Bible. But please don't let this be the extent of your Christian walk. May you understand that what you're learning here is to be walked out when you go home, when you leave the church campus. You're living these truths out and you're walking with Jesus. And as the message spreads, as the message spread here uh, around Asia Minor uh, uh, and, 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 and all throughout Ephesus, it was because people were living that message out. And if our city is going to be impacted in any capacity, if there's going to be change, that it's going to come through the Spirit of God as the Spirit of God resides within you and works through you. I think that sometime in the church, you know, I think sometimes we, that we think that, well, you know, I, I'm just going to live my little private Christian life and I'm not going to bug anybody because you know those things of the past that our grandparents have told us that, well, we must never discuss politics and religion with anybody else, otherwise it's going to create a riot. Paul forgot to get that message, by the way. He created a riot. He created a lot of difficulty, not only here in Ephesus, but in many places around the way that he took the, the message. Because gang, you should understand that you should recognize, you should know that the message that you bring about Jesus is one of those things that rallies against human nature. And, 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 and folks that are, that are uh, dialed into their own self-sufficiency, they will not respond to your message. Christ came for the, those that know that they are sick and as you share the message, realize that God will raise up somebody that is gravely sick, that is looking, that is searching, that is, that is desiring help. And man, that's the open door that you run into. Not for the person that thinks they got it all together. Well, hey, I'm good. I'm cool. Yeah, I'm a Christian. I was raised that way. Uh, you know, I just, uh, you know, this last service, I had a, a conversation with uh, someone at the end of, of the service. And, um, you know, I asked them if they were a Christian. And they said, well, yeah, that's how I was raised. I said, no, 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 but are you like, are you like a Christian? Like, like what the Bible talks about is, is that you have a relationship with, with Christ and so forth. Well, you know, my, uh, my moral things, they, they do stand consistent with the scriptures, but that's not what I'm asking you. What I'm asking you is, is that are you a born again Christian as the Bible declares is what God has given to us. That's the main thing. It's not that I was raised this way. It's not that these are my moral convictions. What matters is, is that I have a relationship with Jesus Christ and the evidence of that relationship is X, Y, and Z is played out within the scripture. You can see signs of life. You can see the fruit. And, and, and you can understand that there's a desire to get with the people of God. A desire to get with the people of God. But when that desire has to be propped up, nursed, or you got to be kicked in the butt to get with the people of God, well, then, it, then there's a question of like, listen, uh, are, you, are you a Christian? And I'm not looking to push, put the lid on anybody here. I'm merely just bringing to the table that we must understand that in, in advancing the gospel, we're going to keep the same basic tenets simple right before us. And that's what Paul was doing. And there was an impact it was having. 
And those people that were sick and tired of, of the religious regimen, that they responded to what Paul was giving, and God did great things within their life. Amazing things. And I don't know about you, but, 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 but I believe that we live here in 2024, that, that we live in an anxiety-filled world. I believe that we live in the moment where, uh, where neighbor is against neighbor, that there's more fighting than there is peace. And I believe that the work that God can do in this moment, starting with his church, can absolutely be fruitful, even in dark days like the days that we're living in now. I, I believe that. And so some people say, well, you're crazy. Well, welcome to the club. Because if you say that you believe in the resurrection of Christ, you're crazy too, according to your neighbor. Welcome to the radical club here. Go Jesus. Now, uh, let, me, uh, le- let, me, let me turn the situation a-, a little bit here, okay? Uh, because I haven't, uh, uh, you know, we haven't talked about any of the historical side um, as we've gotten to this, you know, we're, we're 19 chapters into this study and we've never talked about any of the technicalities of the cities. But I'm going to give you a technicality in this city here. Now, Ephesus, this was the capital city of the, uh, the Roman, uh, Roman, <laughs> how about Roman province of Asia? And, and, and check this out. This city, this town, it had about 300,000 people at the time that Paul was there. Now, do you know your city right here, Westminster? Do you know how many people are in this city? Anybody? Say, I, I hear 100. Do I hear 110? No, no. <laughs> it's like an auction. <laughs> uh, there's, there's about 120,000 people here within this city, spread out over the course of 30 to 35 miles circumference-wise, okay? We're not, we're not dealing with that expansive uh, uh, terrain to, do, to, to spread out 300,000 people here. We're dealing with a smaller circumference, but the population density is much greater. 300,000 people here are stacked in Ephesus. Now, the cool thing about this city is, is that um, where it sat, it, it kind of, like, like uh, uh, the terrain around it, uh, you got the core part of the city, and then looking back, there's like this, this long Broadway, if you will, just a, a main thoroughfare that goes right to the, the seaport. And, and there was a lot of trade that came into this thing. And, and, and in Ephesus, this city, it housed one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It is the temple of Diana. Okay, and now what I want to show you here, I wanna, I'm going to put a picture on the screen here about, it's a life-size model of what uh, they believe that the temple of Diana looked like. This is in Istanbul, Turkey. This picture is from 2007 here. Uh, but this is, this is what the uproar was about right here. This is the place that they would go and worship. Again, replica, replica, life-size, but it's a replica, okay? And so this is, this is the, uh, um, um, you know, kind of the, the, the footprint of what you're looking at here. We're not dealing with sticks. We're not dealing with unsophisticated people. We're not dealing with any of that. We're dealing with people that had the ability to make structures and buildings that were quite amazing, they were still a sophisticated society, though they didn't have, you know, Androids and, a- and Apple phones and all that stuff. Technology was different, but they still were a sophisticated people. And in this temple here, uh, the, the temple of Dianima, Di- God, I, keep, I keep blending two, <laughs> Dianima? <laughs> Diana and Artemis, I probably should just deal with that right now so that I quit saying it this way. Uh, uh, the reason that you see two different words within your Bible, some go Diana, some go Artemis, it's because it's just using a different language. Okay, Diana was coming from the Latin side, Roman, okay? And, and, and Artemis was coming from the Greek side. So now when I say Diana, I'm just a blending of two names. <laughs> now you know why, okay? So the temple that house Diana slash Artemis, okay? Um, this is the female goddess of fertility. Uh, and, and, and the people worshipped this goddess with this trinket. Take a look at the screen here. This is the trinket. Now, this trinket here is, is a real live trinket. It was, it was discovered uh, and, and it's held in a museum. Uh, it's in Turkey. And, and, and the museum is called Seltok. Okay. And so this is a picture from 2020 of it. You can see that the nose is, is kind of messed up on this thing. Uh, but the Turkish archaeolog- archaeological news reports this. And this is, this is what you have. This is the... This is the Woohoo! That's what they're worshiping. Now, this female goddess, you see a lot of things across the chest right there. They are exactly what you think they are. There's a multiplicity of breasts that are laid out here, and that's what they had, you know? Uh, again, this is the female goddess of fertility, and that imagery that is coming is representing that of, of those signs of life, if you will. This fertility goddess gives life, and look at how nurturing and all of this stuff 
And, and, and this is it. So there's the temple. There's a little trinket thing that they were, they were working and, and, and worshiping. And what are you and I to know about this? We're to know this, that in the city of Ephesus, that there was such a massive spiritual darkness that was there. And yet, and yet, the gospel message was having a radical impact upon people and lives were being changed. Not everybody, but many were being changed. And you could see that the tangible signs of repentance were there. That when they were going first at this way and they realized that their, their magical incantations of what they did, verse number 19, Acts 19, you saw that they, they, they found that there was no signs of life within that. There's nothing there. And they got rid of all of their stuff. They had a big old fire within this city and the amount of books that they brought out, you know, again, reflecting of real repentance. And, 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 and man, that, that comes back to questions for us as well is that, hey, listen, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, but are there areas that I'm still hanging on to and I haven't repented of? Do I still have trinkets from the past that don't do any good for me, but that reflect a different lifestyle? If they are, there are we got to get rid of those things. This is just a practical external demonstration of what's gone on on the inside of me, that I'm changed because of, of what God has done. And, and, and man, it culminated in this scene where they took their idols, not only did they stop purchasing them, but they got rid of the ones that they had. They ditched them. They realized that there was nothing that they could do. And when they ditched their idols, there was an impact upon the economy. If we go back over the course of time, and, and, and I don't have this in my notes, I'm just remembering the story from the past, uh, that, uh, uh, that when, uh, it, it is said that when Charles Finney was preaching, that whatever town he came into, and he started preaching there and, you know, that he would hold these, these little revival things and all that stuff. And he's bringing forth the messages that as he stayed there for a short period of time, that the bars would have to close down because so many people, so many drunks, so many, so many heavy drinkers, they came to repentance and, and a real tangible demonstration of things were happening. The spirit of God was getting a hold of the hearts of people and people were coming to that place of repentance. They were changing direction in their life. I, I could wish that in this community, in this fellowship, in the church here in, you know, across the state of Colorado, I could wish that that would be the case because how much, how much fewer human trafficking incidents would happen? How much fewer crazy nonsense of, of, of Palestinian protesters on the corner that are happening right down here? How, how much fewer events of this nonsense in our, our Jefferson public schools that made the, the, the front page news here this week regarding, uh, uh, you know, these, these, um, these uh, policies, there it is, I gotta, be, I gotta be careful with my words here, that the policies that are allowing boys and girls in their, their restrooms and their, um, their quarters to come together when they take a, a trip for sports and all that stuff. The big pushback that is happening within our, our community right now, all of this stuff, stuff that has the ability that when you stand against it, guess what it does? It creates a stinking riot. People get ticked off in you. Oh, there's that political vein. No, no, no. When you're standing up for the moral, uh, you know, for having a moral compass, for having a belief within God, and you're standing upon those principles, Paul tells us that anybody who desires to live godly will suffer persecution. And I would love to share with you here this morning, though it's not a popular message, I'd love to, to share with you, church, church, if you're having an impact in this world, you're going to suffer persecution. People are not going to be happy with you. I don't think we live in an environment where you're going to lose your head, like in the Middle East or something like that. I don't, I don't think it's, uh, you know, something crazy like that. But I do know this, that when, then when the church sits quietly and doesn't allow her light to shine, I do know that our kids are ripped off. I do know that whether it's, whether it's, it's the elementary school, high school, or college, that I, that I do know that the cultural upsweeping of these things, that the advancement of darkness goes forward when the church does nothing. And, 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 and that becomes a powerful message to us to help us understand the right in Ephesus. Paul was doing something with this. He was standing. He brought, uh, he brought the good news about Jesus. Now, we're not all Paul. And for that matter, uh, you guys are not Jeff. You're not me. I, I get an opportunity to stand here and to do this. But what does God have for you? What is the part that God has for you to play within this time? 
If you're sitting on the sidelines, you're suited up, but you're saddled in the bleachers and not doing anything, well, there becomes a, a moment of discovery. Your moment gets to be, you get to discover what God has for you. Listen, if you've got a crazy business, if you're holding a position of authority, you know, if, 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 if you're in a place of influence, well, guess what? God has placed you there for that. Don't quit your job. Don't leave your business. Stand in your business. Let your values of being a Christian be reflected in those spots that you hold within the community, no matter where you are. That's what God is calling you to. Don't hide your moral convictions. Don't hide your relationship with Christ, but keep the main thing, the plain thing. And that is, is that Jesus has set you free from your sin. And listen, and for anybody that will hear that, you want them to hear that. Don't go preaching on your business time or your, your employer's time, but, but have convictions that are consistent with Christ. Does that make sense? Okay, very simple to, to take that down and, and to receive that. Here's the point. If I can underscore it, here's the point. When the gospel is being advanced by the people of God, light shines into very dark places and it breaks people free. That's it. If those crazy Christians that ministered to me some. 32, 33 years ago. If they didn't pursue me for a year and a half, it wasn't like I saw them all the time, but they pursued me literally by way of prayer and conversation for about a year and a half. I thought they were out of their mind. I didn't want no part of it. But I tell you, that night, that, that, that night where I collided with my own sin and, and all the walls fell in on me, I needed what they were bringing. And there was nobody else around. But I knew well enough at that moment to cry out to God and maybe that's, maybe that's the, the value of what God is using you for. Maybe that's the ministry that God is using you for. Maybe you don't immediately see the fruit that comes for it. I, I, I would love to use this fellowship in this very room here as an example. You know, we plow, we plow, we plow, we plow. And you know what? There's some services here where it's like, oh, stink, we need a bigger church. There's other services that happen. It's like, you know, and this seems to be more frequently. It's like, well, we're doing just fine here. You know, there's plenty of empty seats here, right? It's just the ebbs and flows. It's the ups and downs of what happens. It's all part of it. But that same thing is reflected within your life as you share with other people. Sometimes you're going to find that there's a whole lot of like, oh, it's like, oh man, there's rapid fruit that is there. Other times it feels like you're just slugging it out through the mud, turning over the clods, turning over the dry dirt, planting and watering and going, God, is this ever going to make, is this ever going to come to fruition? Like, you know, you're bagging on your spouse. Maybe that's not, not the right word. You're preaching to your spouse. You're living the gospel's message before your spouse. Wonder, you know, are they, are they ever going to come to faith? Listen, what God is, is doing in that, his word is not returning void at all. He's doing something, so keep going. That's all I'm suggesting to you. But may you never forget that as a Christian, you're a distributor of God's love. And this is why it's super important that we learn the full counsel of God. Commentator and, uh, and pastor, he's, he's, uh, uh, he's, he's gone on to heaven now, but, but Warren Wiersbe, he said this in his 2007 commentary, see it on the screen. He says, the church ministers by persuasion, not propaganda. We share God's truth, not man's religious lies. Our motive is love, not anger. And the glory of God, not the praise of men. This is why the church goes on. And I, and I find that to be so illustrative, um, you know, just in those, those few sentences there, to, to, you know, to make sure that we're, we're, we're keeping spot on to where God has us to be. It's not an angry tirade of what God has called us to do as we minister, but it's loving on real people and having difficult conversations along the way because we are to talk with other people. We are to have that dialogue with other folks. And so this takes us to the second idea this morning here, and that is uh, my response to the message. Follow along, verse 28 down through uh, 34 here. Um, Luke writes this. He says, at this, their anger boiled, and they began shouting, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And soon the whole city was filled with confusion. Everyone they rushed to the amphitheater, dragging along Gaius and Aristarchus, who were Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. Paul wanted to go in too, but the, the believers, they wouldn't let him. 
And, and some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, they also sent a message to Paul begging him not to risk his life by entering the amphitheater. Inside, uh, the people were, were, were all shouting, some one thing and some others. Everyone was in confusion. In fact, most of them didn't even know why they were there. The Jews in the crowd, they, they pushed Alexander forward and, and they told him to explain the situation. And he motioned uh, f- uh, for silence and he tried to speak. But when the crowd realized that he was a Jew, they started shouting again. And they kept it up for about two hours. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So you can see this, this scene that Paul had an impact upon Ephesus because people were turning to faith and getting rid of their trinkets, of their little idols here. And that impact, while he had that impact, all of the town wasn't converted. Okay, there, there was still probably much more pe- many people that didn't respond to the message as, as the amount of people that did respond. This theater that they're in, they say that the amphitheater was a, would hold about 25,000 people. So there was, a, there, was a, there was a lot of space here in this. But the response to the message, many people, they, they accept the gospel message that Paul shared, sure. But may you and I never forget that the keeping power of God's Holy Spirit is what gives us our testimony in any given moment. Because we face temptations of all kinds on every side. And we're not always the best witness for Christ. Now the difficulty that happens within ministry, the difficulty that happens in, 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 in living a life of faith, especially within the church, is that we should understand that, that, that struggles are not just a one-time event. That the church is a, is a, is a collection of God's people and there is ongoing difficulty on a daily basis. And some of you, you know, maybe some of you come to church and you go, well, why is a pastor always talking about these difficult things? Because that's the life that I live. I'm always in the middle of difficult things. And you look around here and go, well, my life is fine. Yeah, it is. Thank you, Jesus, for keeping my life grounded. And even those of you that are stubborn, we still pray. We know you by face and name, actually. We know you. God knows you more importantly, and his love is great over your life, but we still pray for you. We still consistently pray, and it's not like I don't have some type of an interaction with, you know, most of this room. I know most of this room. I know you. I know you that are stubborn. I know. I know you that are foul mouth. I know. I know. And, and it's not so much what I know. God knows, thus he keeps us interacting in your life and praying for you and pointing you to the straight way. Trust God. Let God do the work. And so the ongoing difficulties in ministry... They're there because, because people are always rejecting God's counsel in some area, whether it's because of sin, whether it's because of doubt, whether it's because of unbelief, whether it's because of ignorance, whether it's because of, well, this is just my personal preference, whether it's because of scars in the presence or scars in the past, whatever it is. But maybe what I need to remind you of here this morning is, is that, that your response to the message your response to the truth of God's word is what binds Satan and the tools that he likes to use against you to get you tripped up. Because Satan does want to destroy you. Some of you don't have that opposition in the immediacy because you're walking in the same direction that Satan is going so he doesn't mess with you. Your life is okay. Some of you battle back and forth. It's like, well, I come to church, but then I get ripped up on the inside and I leave with the best of intention. But by the time I get to Monday morning, it's game on, man. I don't know how to get out of these things. And I'm back to doing what I did. And I, I, you know, I I have a good time in the first part of the week, but then I start wrestling with things as I get closer to the weekend and all of that stuff. Listen, these are the things that Satan likes to just take you through. So there's no real forward progress in your Christian walk. But, it's, but, 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 but may you take the mask off and recognize who it is. It is the enemy of your soul that is holding you back. Now, if we could, if we could look at this, uh, if we can consider this through the lens of the past, then I would take us to Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah chapter 30, again, 
you're not Israel. We are not Israel. We're the church. But in the book of Isaiah, there was a, the, the, the people were so saturated with the busyness of life that what, the way that they lived their life, it was rebellion against what God had for his people. They knew the right thing to do, but they did nothing with it. And here's, here's, here's what the prophet Isaiah, here's what he records for us. God's telling him to do this. Isaiah 30 and 8, I think it'll be on the screen. He says, now, now go and write down these words. Write them in a book. They will stand until the end of time as a witness. Watch. That these people are stubborn rebels who refuse to pay attention to the Lord's instructions. Can you look to me for just a second? Um, I'm not calling you stubborn rebels, okay? You need to know that, right? Because I know it can change the, the uh, you know, intentionally and unintentionally, it can change the tone of the room, okay? I'm not calling you stubborn rebels. That's not what I'm saying. God was speaking these things through Isaiah to the people of Israel at this time. Now, I'm also not saying this. I'm not saying that there's not stubborn people within this room because there is. And nobody has to, you know, nobody has to do the pointing out. You know before God that you're stubborn. You know. You have a reputation of being stubborn. But if we can learn from the lessons of the past, why don't we learn? Let's consider this. He says one more time in verse number nine, he says, that, he says record this and write this down. He says that these stubborn, these stubborn rebels who refuse to pay attention to the Lord's instruction, watch, watch what they do. They tell the seers, okay, these are the people that are, that are again, they're, they're um, 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 uh, the priest and the prophets and the, and, and if I could put it this way, they're the people speaking for God into the uh, community, okay? You tell the seers, stop seeing visions. They tell the prophets, don't tell us what is right. Tell us nice things. Tell us lies. Forget all the gloom. Get off your narrow path. Stop telling us about your Holy One of Israel. Now, maybe you've had the same thought coming in here. It's like, Pastor, you tell us the same thing week after week. And in reality, we're just traveling through the scripture, just picking up the themes and the threads that, that spill in there. Well, every time I come, you're saying the same thing. No, that's the only thing that you're hearing because God wants to get your attention in that. And, and, and because you hear a redundancy of that message, could we consider of these same type of human uh, inadequacies, weakness, sin, could we consider that many times that God is telling us about the straight and narrow, but we don't want the straight and narrow, we want nice things. God, tell me about nice things. Is that not what we learned last week when Paul said in the pastoral epistles, speaking to Timothy, that the time will come where people are going to refuse good and sound doctrine, wholesome doctrine, that they're going to want to have their itching ears satisfied with the nice things. So, so, so while we're talking here, while we're reading here what Isaiah the prophet gave to Israel, we can also see that God has spoken to the church in the New Testament as well regarding these things. Now, God has not sp spoken these things to hold us down or to cause us to fall back. He's not given us that. But he wants us to understand that stubbornness, a refusal to pay attention, rejecting of good teaching and even leaving the narrow path, that these things are all toxic to our soul. Those are the things where Satan has a foothold and he's at work within the inside of us so that we never arrive to that fullness of what God has for us. God has powerful and special promises for each one of you. Now, if we could go farther and, and, and if we could, maybe we could just take the wisdom of Solomon and overlay it over our lives for just a moment, just, just a, a, a small section of scripture here that we can understand that God has given the remedy for morally drifting. Proverbs 7, 1 to 3, you'll see it on the screen here. Solomon writes, he says, follow my advice, my son. There's that affection, that relationship there. He says, always treasure my commands. He says, obey my commands and live. Guard my instructions as you guard your own eyes. Tie them on your fingers and remember, write them deep within your heart. Now, it is couched in language from the past, so often we don't really get this. 
you know, because as soon as we start seeing obey and commands and all of that stuff, we immediately move to this point to where our minds just naturally press the pause button and go, well, that's the old covenant, I'm out. And we miss the greater nuggets of what God is giving the wisdom that is coming that is consistent with God's character, past, present, future, because God doesn't change, is nothing more than he wants us to understand that by way of a close relationship, he desires to speak to us the good things to help us within our life. And when he wants to speak these good things to us, what the response that he has for us to do is to hang on to these truths. Remember these truths. Why? So that you can put them in motion within your life again, we read it here, obey and commands and all that stuff. But if we can change the language to what we understand in 2024, we can see it's like, oh, wait a minute. That speaks volumes to me. He says, guard these instructions as you guard your eyes. Well, why am I guarding these instructions like I guard my eyes? Well, because what about the eyeballs? What does the Bible tell us about the eyeballs? The Bible declares to us here that, that, that our eyeballs, yeah, they're the windows to our soul. Yeah, that's true. But they're the things, our eyes, they're the things, they're the mechanism, they're the, the, the faculty of our, of our bodies that Satan uses to divert us away from having an attention towards the Lord. And what does he do? What, is, what does John tell us? First John, I think it's uh, chapter two. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. It's not of the Father, but of the what? It's of the world. Most of you didn't know that because you're not, you're, 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 well, you need to be exposed to it or you need to read it yourself. It's not of the Father, it's of the world. And if it's of the world, it's a tool of Satan to do what? To trash your Christian walk. That's the goal. And we, we need to turn our focus away from, from browbeating the pastor who's bringing us the narrow path. And we need to take the truths that are being presented to us, taught to us, and we need to chew on these things and realize, wait a minute, if, if this is good for me, I want it. Not like, hey, I can't stomach that right now because I'm, I'm, I'm so filled up on all of these other things that are bringing really harm into my life. Well, I'm not harming anybody, Pastor, the things that I look at. Really, is that true? Is that true? Right? Statistically speaking, man and woman in the church in this room right now, I don't know, three quarters of the room, are we, are we in that metric yet? The three quarters of the room wrestles with pornography in the church? Man and woman collectively? Wow, that's a, that's a heavy stat. And so it does become important as to what we put before our eyes. Well, nobody sees, nobody knows. Well, you know, uh, uh, I think Moses followed that advice too because he looked left and he looked right and he killed the Egyptian. He forgot to look where? Are you forgetting to look up? Are you forgetting today to look up? Because you think it's okay, but is it really okay? He tells us, guard your own eyes. He says, tie these things around your, 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 your fingers, write them down within your heart. What does this have to do with us? What, is it, what does this mean? Well, can you just think that, that we are the hands and the feet of Christ? And what do we do with our hands and our feet? We use them for good. And if we're allowing our hearts to be governed by God, the things that we touch and if I could just, you know, illustration, metaphor, the things that we touch, okay? If we can just say that, the reflection of what happens in and through our life, that there's a print that is being made. We're leaving a fingerprint somewhere. It's either for good or not for good. And he wants us to keep these things retained within our heart. Uh, not only the core of who we are, but the motion, you know, the emotion of, of what we carry. You know, Christianity is not designed to be a boring drudgery. If, if, if you're living Christianity that way, you know the theme, you know the tune. You've heard these things before, church. That if you're living Christianity in that way, it just shows that you're not living the authentic. You've been sidetracked into something. You've been sucker punched and the life has been sucked out of you. Because what is consistent with God's spirit? Joy and peace. And, and think about all the power that we've been talking about. And goodness and self-control all wisdom, you know, all of these things. I mean, who doesn't, I mean, I want more love. I want more peace. I want more joy, right? I mean, I go to great lengths to satisfy this creepy flesh of mine. You know, give me some more food. Make me happy, baby. Come on. I married a cook. That woman can cook, by the way. She's my woman, so don't look at her. So. <laughs> um. I'm not sure if I made a point here or not. 
Let me try. Um, Psalm 65 and 3. Let's try this. Let's see if we got this. Maybe we can make a point here. Man, do you see that? Psalm 65 and 3. Though we are overwhelmed by our sins, you forgive them all. That's God. We're reminded of these truths. There's real danger out there of, of being distracted by Satan. The remedy is to hang on to God's truth so that we don't morally drift. And the restart, as we need it, is just remembering this psalm. It's just, it's just communicating a big truth of what, who God is, what God has done. And we close our morning off with this. The final idea of the morning is, is uh, in neglecting the cure. Verse 35 through 41 says this. It says, at last the mayor, that he was able to quiet them down enough to speak. He says, citizens of Ephesus, everyone knows that Ephesus is the official guardian of the temple of the great Artemis. Now, 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 now listen to these words. Whose image fell down to us from heaven. What in the world? Since this is an undeniable fact, you should stay calm and don't do anything rash. You know, I tried to use this same type of logic and reasoning here with my mom one time. I was 14 years old and um, I have a, uh, um, uh, my middle brother, he's only 18 months younger than me. And so we were uh, by way of look and by way of uh, flavor and taste, really through uh, the entirety of our life, we've looked so much alike and people have confused me with him and him with me and all this stuff. And when we were teenagers, I did what every good teenager brother would do. I gave my brother a hard time often and frequently. But when he would try to mess with me, well, I needed to make sure I, I won, right? Because that's what all big brothers do. They want to win. And if you're not a big brother, you don't know how I feel. So stop judging me. So... <laughs> And so as a big brother, he messed with me. He did something stupid and got me ticked off. And my mom had her back turned away from me down at the end of the hall. And he's like running up to try to go behind mom so I don't do anything. Well, I took an orange off of the uh, kitchen table. It's amazing. It's a good orange. Good size orange, by the way. Juicy. And I hummed it at him. Well, I guess my aim wasn't as good as I intended. <laughs> I didn't hit mom. For those of you who think I hit mom, I didn't hit mom. It was worse. Uh, I, I think I'm using this, this word right. So help me out if, I'm not, if I don't get it right, okay? A curio cabinet, it like has all, it's like glass cabinet, has all these fine things in it. Why are you getting all upset already? <laughs> oh man, I put a good, you know, and I, you know, I'm, I, I'm bull-legged and I throw sidearm. I put a good sidearm thing on that, that orange and bam, right into the curio cabinet. It sucker exploded. Yeah, it got bad right at that, that point. <laughs> what did I say? I made some stupid excuse immediately. He made me do it. Watch, watch. We know that the official guarding of the temple of the great Artemis, whose image fell down to us from heaven, since this is an undeniable fact, you should stay calm and not do anything rash. Mom, he made me do it. Don't get upset at me. Get upset at him. The stupidity of, of what these folks were believing is, is that something fell out of heaven. This little icon thingy that you saw here, this multi-breasted dealio thing, this reflection of, of uh, Diana, uh, Artemis, and, and all of this stuff. This is what these people were putting their, their hope, their trust, their confidence, th everything that they had. They were putting it into this. It was a place where the seven wonders of the world were, where it was one of the seven wonders of the world. And they came there. People came from all around the world to come to worship, to pay you know, respect, to do these particular things. And yet, for many people, neglecting the simple cure that God has for us, in this scene here that is unfolding here through Acts chapter 19, it culminates here in this mayor of, of calming the city down. Verse 40, he says, I'm afraid that we're in danger of being charged with rioting by the Roman government since there is no cause for all this commotion. And if Rome demands an explanation, we won't know what to say. And then he dismissed them and they dispersed. Chapter 20, verse 1, when the uproar was over, Paul sent for the believers and encouraged them. And then he said goodbye. And he left for Macedonia. 
So this riot brought an end and brought a closing of the door here for the ministry that he was supposed to do there. God brought his time to that end. And his influence, his impact and all that, it, it culminated right here with this. And, and, and he left. He moved on to the next spots, Macedonia, Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, these, this, this region of north. For you and I, that I would love to encourage us that we would not neglect the cure because what Christ has given to us, there are many people within our world, there are many people within your life that will push off of it. In the book of Romans, chapter one, they'll put these verses on the screen. That Paul is declaring to the church, he's given them sound doctrine as he just starts out the book of Romans. And he, he's starting out by giving that testimony and saying, listen, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God to salvation for everybody that believes. And the work of salvation that was going on within Ephesus was amazing. But there is also people in your life, in my life, in Ephesus, and even what Paul deals with for the church here in the book of Romans that, that will not retain these truths. Romans 1 and 20 says, for ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, that there is a creator, folks his eternal power and his divine nature. And so they have no excuse for not knowing God. That's a pretty heavy thing. He says, yes, they knew God. They know that there's a God out there, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. And as a result, their minds became dark and confused, claiming to be wise. They instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious ever living God, they worship idols made like, like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. What were they doing in Ephesus? The little trinkets, these little things that this, this trade guild, these, these craftsmen, the things that they made, they were worshiping these idols. And the gospel message impacted that trade there. And this last portion of Acts uh, 19 here. It's all about the, uh, you know, the, uh, the economic difficulty, the, the riotous conditions that were created because people were responding to the gospel message. Now, now, now before moving on to a couple more verses here in, in Romans, think about this. When you stand for the gospel message today and you take a, 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 a stand of faith that there is, watch, go with me here on this, that there is men and there are women. Just that simple aspect right there. And you refuse to get involved in all the nonsense with the pronouns and that, you know, your whatever those things are. When you take just a simple stand like that, guess what happens? You become that person that is saying, wait a minute, there is a God in heaven. There is a way forward. And you become that lightning rod for chaos and maybe even riotous conditions. And it gets even much better than that. Verse 24, it says, so God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things that their hearts desire. As a result, they did violent, they grating things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worship and they serve the things that God created instead of the creator himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. That is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires even the women turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulged in sex with each other. And the men, instead of having normal sexual relationships with women, they burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men. And as a result of this sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty that they deserved. He goes on, he goes on, he goes on, he goes on. I just want you to understand. I just want you to recognize that conditions don't get better by neglecting the cure. That what God has called the church to do is to, to, to stand for Christ. And as we stand for Christ, we allow the light of his morality to shine through us. And we do take a stand against these things. There are real things that are out there. And there are really schools in our community, this community right here, <clears throat> that are being impacted this week from this same lunacy right here that I just read to you. Our kids are being hit by this stuff. When you stand with a biblical morality against that in opposition to the, to, to, to the culture with the clear direction of the heart of God, you come across as somebody that is, well, you're insensitive. You just want to do this. You just want to do that. No, 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 no. 
Take the spark off of all of that. Let God carry the weight of the spark. You stand for God. God has put his spirit within you. Understand what he says. Understand who he is. Don't be a knucklehead. Don't go out there and create an unnecessary riot. But please realize that you are called to stand. And we would not have the amount of grievous problems that we have within our community, within our state, if there were more of the church was standing up. Because there would be an impact upon our communities because we're committed to the truth of God and we're standing to those things. You read these things out of the scripture here today and even in the church, this room right here, you guys, okay? I, again, I don't know all of you, but, but, but you get the furrowing brow looks that are coming towards me by presenting these truths to you. They're not my truths, gang. I can smile at you, keep on going. They're not my truths. This is what God has given to you. And I would leave you with this. 1 Timothy 1 and 19 on the screen here. Uh, again, it's, this is Timothy. Paul's writing to Timothy. Timothy was the pastor in Ephesus after Paul left. Paul is telling Timothy, he says, cling to your faith in Christ and keep your conscience clear. For some people have deliberately violated their consciences. As a result, their faith has been shipwrecked. When you give in to the spirit of the age and you depart from the wholesome teaching that is found within the word, watch the narrow road of God's word, you will shipwreck your faith. There's only one way to walk forward. You're either with him or you're not. God has an established order over creation. And the encouragement that we get or that we close our time with just regarding this riot here within Ephesus is that we are to keep a clear conscience before God by standing in agreement with the truths in which he has given to humanity, his church. Amen?